With a voice and a face like this, I got nothing to worry about. I can always drive a cab. Daniel, hi. Could you make me a woman? Honey, I'm so happy. Good afternoon and welcome to the Capehart podcast on Washington Post Live. I am Jonathan Capehart, associate editor of the Washington Post. I Was Better Last Night is the instantly engaging memoir from a writer, creator, producer, and actor who has won four Tony Awards, three Drama Desk Awards, and numerous other awards for Torch Song Trilogy, La Caja Fall, and Hairspray. You've seen him on Broadway, the big screen, the small screen, and now you're seeing him streaming on Washington Post Live. He is the great Harvey Firestein. Welcome to K-Part on Washington Post Live. I recognized you immediately, Jonathan, immediately. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't need Richie Jackson to tell me I was talking to you. <laughs> well, you know, Richie, th th this is one of the great things is that it's always wonderful when you share a truly close friend with someone else. And Richie Jackson is definitely that person for me. Good, good. Yes, well, you know, you know I've known him since he's 17, I think. So. Yes, no, I, yes, I do. Uh, wait, long. so we have to talk about your book. Um, yes. I, I lo love your book. Um, you told the Daily Beast that writing your memoir was, quote, like giving birth. I'm sure it's very painful but you don't remember that part. You just look at the baby. Um, and that the rave reviews for it is like, quote, kind of like dreamland. Um, what was the hardest part of writing this book? Uh, 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 my own negativity in my own head, that's always the hardest part of anything, isn't it? It's always mm -hmm. that fear of fear of doing something. But um, because my, my I, I don't usually write prose, you know, long form prose. Um, I've written a children's book. I write op-eds and stuff like that. But a book book, it's kind of a daunting thing to think about. But if you don't try, you never know whether you can or not, right? And and I figured it's just a computer and the computer, I have lots <laughs> of junk on this computer that will never, anybody will ever see. So I'm, I figured I might as well try. So I sat mm -hmm. myself down. And it was during COVID, so it wasn't like you could go outside or nothing. So I sat myself down and I started writing what's now the chapter one. Um, I wrote the preface later, but uh, the story about uh, being in second grade and being made to be the king in, in Sleeping Beauty when I really wanted to be the evil witch with the long nails. <laughs> well, look, black nails. Um, but I, <laughs> But I'm going to a, I'm going to a wedding this weekend. You have to have black nails. Um, so I did not so, know that. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, oh, yeah. There's there are many rules these days. Many rules. <laughs> well, oh, Harvey, go ahead. I was going to say, if you're not going to wear black tie, then wear black nails. Then wear black nails. Well, since you mentioned your preface, I want to read something um, that you you wrote in your preface about you know what it was like to write the book. Um, you write, sure, I recall the victories and joys and laughs and lovers, but for reasons beyond me, those happier remembrances are cloudy, dimmed, and distant. I have to, I have to reach for them, whereas the miseries and hurt, every mistake, misfortune, and betrayal I endured or delivered remains conveniently at my fingertips. Uh, then you go on to say, the adage, time heals everything, makes a, a lovely lyric, but is a blanking lie. Pain and regret are our brain's legacy residents with great views and easy access to the world outside. I, I underlined it because it is such a perfect way of describing the, the, the battle of the good memories versus the bad memories. Um, 
was it really that hard to reach for the joy that was in your life? Well, let me let me just explain. I I believe I come up with these theories. They're usually wrong, but they really work good for me. And also, one of my one of my one of my philosophies is change your mind every day. So so I come up with these theories. But this theory. <laughs> is that the reason we remember the painful stuff is the same reason that it's built into us to remember not to touch the hot pan on the stove, you'll get burned. So mm -hmm. I think somehow into our animal brains, um, the negative is still built in to be accessible as, as lessons learned. Um, happiness and you know where to find food is built in there too. Look at me. But... Um, but but the negative is 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 right there so that you don't make the same mistakes, though we often do make the same mistakes over and over again. But mm -hmm. was it hard to access the happy stuff? Listen to me. I, I'm a silly sort of person, and I and I love the happy stuff, and and um and I love my life, and I've survived my life. I guess that's the real point is, I've actually survived being me. Uh, that's something to celebrate. <laughs> when you say you su survived being me, flesh that out. What exactly, are, what, what exactly do you mean by that? Well, um, as, as you saw in the book, um, I got through the whole period of AIDS and that, that's, that, that, rather bad period of life and um and during that period I, I was sinking further and further into depression without really realizing it um because i was covering it with alcohol and so i went very far down the alcoholic road when i finally quit drinking which was not really my choice um i was i was averaging half a gallon a day of 100 proof southern comfort so I was pretty far down that road. So I, um, I attempted suicide. And on the other side of the suicide, I've always considered that a new life. I've always considered that um, a rebirth. And um, so surviving me, I meant doing things my way led me to that very bad place. So now I do things differently and I'm having a very good time. I've been so well, by the way, 26 years. 20, 26 years. Congratulations on, on 26 years. Let's go back to the beginning of the surviving being you. Because you write in the book that you believe that you survived the, the AIDS epidemic because you got bored with going to the trucks and got bored with, ca got bored with casual sex, just decided one day, you know what? This is not for me. Talk more about that. Well, you know, boys are boys. <laughs> oh, I know Boy. all about them, Harvey. <laughs> you know, they built zippers into our pants and the rest is history. We, we don't need a lot of other work to have sex, you know. We don't need a lot of motivation. We don't need conversation at all. Um, as I found out, you know, in my, in my sexual um, um, history, you, 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 boys, you know, you have sex and then you go for pizza. It's, uh, you, you know, you only ask each other's names if um, maybe you've been dating for a couple of years. It's boys. So, uh, so I was in that world, which is a great world to be in when you're living as I was living because I was living a sort of three-way life. I had, I was the nice Jewish boy at home and then I was going to school full time and then I was doing theater and art things in, in at night. And so, uh, sex was easiest if it could be anonymous and quick and, you know, zipper up, zipper down, you're out of there. So I, I fell into that. Um, mm -hmm. I did have affairs. I did have boyfriends. I did really seek to have a, a, a really a good emotional connection, but somehow I've never been very good at that, which is another whole story. So, but I was um, at this one period, which was just before Tort Song opened off Broadway, I was a sort of um, still in, in, in this casual sex thing. And, um, and a line came to me from Colette, of all people. And it was when he and he and he became them, I gave up men. And I thought, you know, 
it's true they have no personality to me that they're, they're not meaning anything to me they're not giving me anything emotionally or physically beyond an orgasm um a little tension reliever um i'm taking advantage and losing my I'm taking advantage of the easy and losing the humanity and i thought this can't possibly be good so i stopped doing that nonsense and uh it just happened to time out at the beginning of the aids crisis mm -hmm. and while you're dealing with all of this you're also um dealing with your own gender identity i mean you write in the you you write in the book you know my mind was struggling with jigsaw puzzle pieces that came in an unmarked box you just mentioned a moment ago um, how you wanted to play, um, you wanted to play the queen, but you were made to play, <laughs> you were made to play uh, a, a male character. Talk about how early did you start having this conversation in, in your head about, wait, am I a boy? Am I a girl? What's going on here? I, I, that conversation was always going on with me. Um, I, well, and, and it does with every child. Uh, that's the, the the lie is that it doesn't. I mean, the child may not remember and or may try not to remember or the easiness of assuming that a kid is heterosexual and is in the right body for everything else. It, it's just easier to go along with what you've been handed. Uh, so and most people don't <laughs> ask questions. But as you know, every gay child, forget about gender at the moment, every gay child grows up in a family or their whatever their circumstance is, looks at the world around them and tries to figure out where they belong. Now, a heterosexual child sees very easily where they belong. Oh, I'm a girl. I belong here. I'm attracted to boys, blah, blah, blah the opposite of boys. Every gay child does that same math problem and comes out with a different answer and then has to go back and run all the the compilations again to see where they come out they come out with a different answer and th that goes on and that's actually the act of coming out that's how we come out to ourselves some people don't get that right answer until they're 50 60 70 years old but that is coming out so i was doing all that and in the midst of all that was also gender um our generation didn't discuss gender as much as right now we're discussing gender. And let me just say, I don't know where this conversation is going to end, which is why I find it so fascinating and exciting. Mm -hmm. We're like putting new names on things. We're like asking what is really the role of male and female? Is it about how we dress? Is it about our role as human beings? Is it, a, is it about our role in reproduction? Um, you know, what is it? The uh, Native Americans, of course, had two spirit, I, the mm -hmm. idea of two spirit. We don't have any of that stuff. We're finding it now. We're, we're, we're up to that point in our evolution because people are constantly changing and people are constantly, I know, most people don't like to think about change. Change is no. scary, scary stuff. But right. that's where we are. Right now we're talking about gender and it's very exciting. Well, you know, Harvey, to your point, as you were responding to that, um, to the, the question, you know, we had a member of, of the Senate, uh, Senator Marsha Blackburn, questioning Judge Katanji Brown Jackson about her definition of of a woman. I would love to know what you made uh, of that line of questioning to a potential Supreme Court justice. I, uh, I think those people, I'm so tired of those people. <laughs> I know you have to cover them all the time. I just want them all to just flush the toilet and go away. I'm so tired of those people. With they don't, They're in a bubble, they're in a very strange bubble where they only talk to each other or they talk to their assistants. They have nothing to do with the real world. They don't have to worry about anything. Their bills are paid. Their insurance is paid for the rest of their lives. They are settled and set and they have no connection to reality anymore. And I don't like politicians. They just piss me off. So. When you take a politician and you allow them to ask a real person a question, not to mention a person who's looking at the law, 
They're not looking at it at a social idea. The woman is a judge who's looking at the law, which is a very different thing to do than I do. I look at a social situation. I look at, you know, who's dating who. She needs to look at the law. She needs to see how it's been set out. Is it right? Is it, does it still fit where we are? It's a hard job being a judge and to be handed stupid questions like that, insulting stupid questions, I think just shows you how stupid the questioner is. Mm -hmm. Asking um, to find what a woman is, is, I mean, right. yeah, I, wouldn't ask, I know philosophers that I wouldn't ask that question of. <laughs> can we talk about Torch Song Trilogy? Um, we because can want to. We can talk about anything you want. I am oh. here for you. No. <laughs> oh, I know. That's the thing. I've got so many questions on a whole host of topics because I know you could talk about anything. But I want to talk about Torch Song Trilogy okay. and really about how – talk about the reaction to Torch Song Trilogy when it first came out in the 80s and the reaction to Torch Song Trilogy – uh, when you and, and Richie brought it back in 2018? Well, I wrote, I finished writing Torch Song in 1978. Um, yes, I finished the three plays in 1978 and then went on this quest to find somebody to put the three plays together and mount them, which what turned out to be the Glines, this, this gay theater in New York. And we, we did the play in a five floor walk up theater with where the ceilings were it was the richard allen center and, and the the rain would come down if it rained and uh, you know right in the center of the stage and wasn't ideal but um then it moved off broadway but we became a big hit all that stuff <laughs> but what i can tell you is that 85 percent of our audience back then was heterosexual they were theater goers regular average theater goers that would go see Equus or go see Amadeus or go see Night Mother. They were 85% heterosexual. The gay men that came in to see us would come in a little shyly. They would sort of look around to make sure who else is seeing them go into the theater. There was something dangerous about seeing Torch Song because Torch Song was as your audience may or may not know, openly gay. It was a story about a man seeking to create a family in a world that didn't have families for gays. He was seeking to, to adopt a, an abused boy. Um, he was seeking to have a relationship um, with, with someone, well, to two people uh, by the end of the play, and also fighting uh, the, the norms uh, of the day. So they came into the theater frightened. Um, they sat there, they laughed, whatever, but it was a dangerous feeling. When we brought the play back in 2018, the audience was 85% gay, and they were not sneaking into the theater. The play belonged to them, it didn't belong to me anymore, it belonged to them. It was part of their history, it was part of their their consciousness. There were older men bringing younger men to see the play, to see what they used as their coming out. There were gay people who heard about it but didn't really know what it was. And they came to the theater laughing and loud and proud and crews in the audience. And there was 15% heterosexual and, and these gay. And and they sat and they laughed and they carried on through the show until the mother came out, mm -hmm. the, the great Mercedes rule. And when Mercedes appeared and the mother starts in on Arnold about his lifestyle. Lifestyle. Yeah, welcome 1982. We were we were back when we, they were sinking down in their chairs. They were just as scared as ever, which of course made me laugh because because uh, you say, okay, for all the growing we do, we're still all scared of our parents. We still want our parents' approval. We still we may have we may have become independent, but no one's totally independent. Nobody, no one's in this alone, as as Stephen Sondheim would say. Um, sorry. <laughs> It's it 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 was very interesting to watch. 
So the, the, the one thing, I, I don't know if I knew this or I forgot it, but it, maybe I, my, my memory is getting it wrong, but I think I have it right. The original actress who played your mother in Torch Song was Estelle Getty. Yes. Well, no. Yes and no. The original actress who played my mother in Torch Song was this little Pachech woman who used to torture me back in La Mama, which is where I started in Off Off Broadway. And she would come to see my shows and she'd make me crazy. Write a role for your mother and I'll play it. Write a role for your mother, I'll play it. And the idea of this woman who came up to my titties, of her playing my mother just really made me laugh because my mother's not much taller than her. But there was this woman, Estelle Gettleman from Bayside, Queens, whose husband uh, replaced uh, Auto Glass. She used to call him Martin Borman. So you can know her kind of sense of humor. Um, mm -hmm. And I wrote the role for the mother for her. You know that you have a first edition of the plays if you open to the cast list and where it says, where it has the name Estelle Getty, there's still room to put the rest of her name because she had just changed her name when the book was being published. So Estelle Gettleman, who starred in Torch Song at La Mama, became Estelle Getty. Um, and we went to Broadway and all that. And then she then she went on tour with the show because she wanted to go to L.A. When she got to L.A., obviously Golden Girls audition happened. Um, she went in. It was supposed to only be a guest spot. She wasn't supposed to be a regular on the show, but she hit a home run and the rest is showbiz history. <laughs> it is indeed. Um, you know, you mentioned La Mama and off, off Broadway. And as I was reading it, you know, that was, I mean, I got to New York in, in 1991. Um, but, it, you know, theater, La Mama is still, still going off, off Broadway, experimental theater, reading about the rain drop it, dripping down. Uh, it, you were just talking about, I'd gone to plays um, in spaces where folks are putting their, all their heart and soul into the roles in these, tiny, in, in these tiny theaters. I wonder what you make of theater today. Does theory, and you did some edgy stuff. I mean, you write about some of the props you made and, you know, I'm not going to get into it. Folks, you just need to read the book. You got to read the book. <laughs> but you were, you were edgy, even for, even for that time. Does theater still have that edge? Oh, absolutely, it does. And there are people making theater. If you're making theater, we didn't do it to shock. We did it because it was our lives. We did it because it was an expression of who we were. Um, well, I guess there were always are people that 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 go out to shock. Um, but even they are trying to say something. They are trying to say this is you know this is what I find shocking. This is how, how I want to affect you. But theater is always about expressing yourself and affecting an audience. Um, it's it's different than painting. Um, it, it's closer to music. Well, any performing stuff does. It needs the ear of the uh, and, and the eyes of the of the audience to be to complete the picture. You can't do you can't do theater in a box by yourself. Um, and so there are still people um, doing incredible work uh, at lots of little theaters all over the country, all over the world. Um, and there are festivals for those plays. And, and from those plays, sometimes something will come out, at, you know, that's more mainstream or at least try to make it. Ta Taylor Mack, who's a wonderful uh, theater artist, um, had a play uh, brought to Broadway a couple of seasons ago. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Is theater it, is, you know, go ahead. Theater is? Theater is living. And, you know, last month, um, the New York Public Library for Performing Arts at Lincoln Center announced it will design the Harvey Firestein Theater Lab. What do you hope they do uh, under your name at that the Harvey Firestein Theater Lab? Well, the library is a public space that I, I've always found uh, uh, completely meaningful. My mother was a librarian, um, so if I didn't if I didn't give to a library, I'd be in hot stuff with her. <laughs> but, um, but the library is a place that you can go. You don't have to have any money. You know, you get a library card and go in and sit and read and access. The entire world is yours. 
it's yours. And the New York Public Library of the Performing Arts at Lincoln Center not only has the books and all that kind of stuff, it has special collections. They go and they videotape as many shows as they can afford to. And those tapes, although there's no substitution for seeing theater live, we can go there and we can see legendary performances mm. on tape, not the greatest quality sometimes, you know, but because they don't go and edit it up, you know, five cameras, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, they, it's usually one camera or two cameras capturing it all, but you can go there and see these legendary performances that, you couldn't otherwise. So it's a great resource. But there was no place in the library if I wanted to bring a couple of friends and watch something like that, you know, and then experiment with it, you know, and, and try something out. There was no place because you can't make noise in a library. <laughs> so the idea of having a theater lab where maybe you can book an hour or two to rehearse or a teacher can bring some students in and say, okay, we're here and let's look at this. Let's think about that. Let's be in this space for free. Um, that spoke to me. Using, um, using spaces as, as much by the public as possible is important to me. As I knew would happen, time would fly talking to you. So we only have to, uh, uh, so that means I can't ask you about, you know, how you're reworking um, Kinky Boots and Funny Girl. Um, we don't have enough time to talk about this. You've got well, seven I saw, active... I saw Funny Girl last night. I saw Funny Girl last night and it's in great shape and I had a wonderful time sitting there. The audience had a wonderful time. It's selling out. It's, we're, we're really thrilled. Um, so you've I'm got, you, you've got, uh, uh, what? I don't know if these two are part of the seven active projects you have going. So there's a lot of stuff that we haven't even been, been able to talk about or even scratch the surface on in your book. But I want to end um, to get you to talk about um, what's happening in the country in terms of what people, um, politicians, uh, state legislatures, um, what they're doing to LGBTQ plus kids. And this is in relation to a question that we got from Elizabeth Robinson, who's in Ohio. And she asks, what do you say to LGBTQIA plus kids who keep seeing their rights being challenged? You have to just keep fighting. They, they would like, these old people, these politicians, these old, mostly old men, you know, you look at Grassley and you say, why are you still alive, let alone in Congress? I don't mean that. I'm, I'm very happy the man's alive, but not making laws. He doesn't understand. Like I said, too many years, he hasn't even paid a bill. So he doesn't understand anything. Young people must declare the world they want. The world does belong to young people. Our job, us old farts, our job is to support their ideas. Right now, we're seeing a reaction of frightened old people. People that say, I want to go backwards. I want to go backwards. You can't go backwards. It's impossible to go backwards. History doesn't work that way. The world doesn't work that way. Time doesn't work that way. You want to go backwards, go sit in your house and go through your scrapbook and have a lovely time and let the rest of us live. Because those of us who love life want to ever move forward. And moving forward, unfortunately, means change. And change is scary, but that's what we need to do. We need to be open to change. We need to be open to questions. I fought for the use of the words gay and lesbian. You don't think it's strange for me to now have to adjust to they and them? But it's exciting. It's something I don't totally understand. It's exciting. It's opening a new world. I mean, I, I tease about it. I say, so what are we going to do? We're going to redo all Broadway shows. So instead of Funny Girl, it's going to be Funny They. And instead of Golden <laughs> Boy, it's going to be Golden Them. I mean, I tease about that. But the truth is that they will create 
their own art. They will create their own theater that speaks to them as I created my theater that spoke to me. And it's exciting and it's wonderful and I can't wait to see what tomorrow has in store. Those old farts that are sitting there saying, don't say gay and all that, dead. DeSantis is dead. His, his brain is dead. It's over. All he can think of is, how do I raise money? How can my campaign go? I want to be president. I want, I want, I want, I want. That's all they think is I want. And they don't want to give up their power. Look at Putin. Look at the destruction. The destruction of someone who wants to move backwards. They can destroy the world moving backwards. You must constantly move forward. So I say to kids, be brave, decide the world you want, and there are plenty of us that will back you up, tell us what you want, and we will be behind you. Tony Award-winning playwright and actor, the great Harvey Fierstein, thank you so much for coming to Capehart on Washington Post Live. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for having me and read my book. (laughs) (laughs) I was better last night, a memoir. It's right here. Thanks, Harvey. And thank you for joining us. To check out what interviews we have coming up, head to WashingtonPostLive.com. Once again, I'm Jonathan Capehart, Associate Editor of The Washington Post. Thanks for watching Capehart on Washington Post Live.